Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, software-defined radios and GNU Radio Companion. But before we get started, I wanted to apologize for the video and audio quality because it said this bothers me too, trust me. But um, I'm shooting this video very impromptu, and so at best all I have is the webcam and uh, the microphone that's built into my laptop and they're both fairly crappy so again I'm sorry I figured that might as well make a video while I have uh, the opportunity uh, versus really you know being bothered by the quality um, fortunately this talking head portion of it is fairly small and so you'll mostly see me in the corner so what is a software-defined radio? A software-defined radio is a dongle. Looks like this. Let me get a better shot of it. This is just one of the ones I own. I own another one. Again, upside down. There we go. Um, they are actually internally nearly identical. There are some vague differences in their setup, etc. The real big difference between the two is the connector for the antenna. This is an SMA connector, and this is something else. And originally, I was not as much of a fan of this guy, but I had the foresight when I bought this to get one of these with it Let's see if i can get it to focus this is an adapter that adapts this weird little connector to sma and so with the foresight to get this adapter now i can connect any kind of antenna that i can also connect to this guy so back to what is a software defined radio a software-defined radio is effectively the front end of a receiver. So this has all of the stuff that a typical receiver would have. So we can tune specific frequencies and um, be able to process them, etc. But this does not have any kind of decoder. And what a decoder does is it takes the signal after it's been tuned and received and turns it into something useful. Instead, what this dongle does is it um, receives it and then creates a data stream of all of the points um, that this received and sends it off through the USB interface to a computer. What that allows you to do is that allows you to create your own decoder any way you want to. And to play with this, I decided to read the stream that comes out of the key fob for my wife's car. My car is actually kind of old, so I don't have a key fob for it. So playing with my wife's key fob was the next best thing. Now, a quick thing to note is that uh, this guy comes with an antenna that looks like this. And what's really nice about this antenna is that it's nice to travel with because the thing is very compact and the whole thing can fit into your backpack and i have yet had this, the tsa ask any questions about this you know knock on wood but this is nice so to be clear before we start to delve into this too far is this is not a super super in-depth uh video um I'm going to gloss over certain things. I'm going to try to delve into some more stuff that doesn't seem to be as documented as uh, others. Uh, for instance, the software that you see in front of you is called SDR Sharp. Uh, you can get pretty uh, decent instructions on how to set this guy up at RT, uh, rtl-sdr.com, where I got this dongle. Uh, the SDR Sharp software is actually made for a different uh, software-defined radio, but uh, people have adapted it 
uh, over the years to work with all kinds. And so let's get started. So as I mentioned, what you see here is SDR Sharp. Uh, you can see the version number up here in the upper left-hand corner. It's V1.0.0.1700. Uh, the version number does actually um, store what I'm looking for uh, matter because some versions are more buggy than others. Uh, what I have here is I have selected my RTL SDR from the list. Whenever you hit this gear, I have it configured. As of right now, it's sampling at 2.4 uh, mega samples per second. That is the data stream that's coming out of the dongle into the computer. Um, the sampling mode, etc., doesn't matter. What matters here is the gain. And I do have the gain turned up. Most likely you will need to have the game turned up. So it's 40.2 dB gives me a pretty decent result. And uh, once all of that is configured, I can hit play. And you'll see that this graph here is now live. Uh, this graph here is the frequency spectrum that I'm looking at. And I'm located in the US. And so um, if you just do a quick Google search of uh, what frequency do key fobs in the U.S. operate, you will get that they operate at 315 megahertz, which is shown up here, which I have tuned to. And basically what I did was I tuned to 315 megahertz, and then I hit the button on the remote. I will hit the button now, and you saw things happen. Right over here, you saw something jump up. I'm going to hit the button again. Boom, it jumps up, and so now I can um, use the scroll wheel to center the sub. in my window here, and what we're looking at, a little more, is about 314.475 megahertz is where the signal of the ski fob is. It's never exactly 100, and, I'm sorry, 315. It usually falls somewhere on either side of that, and here it is. Now that we can see the signal, this is really the end of the easy part. We know where the signal is. Boom, there it is. But, um, what is the signal doing? What, how do I read the signal, etc.? That's where it becomes more difficult. Um, speaking strictly from experience, I know that uh, if you look at the, which by the way, the portion of the signal, the, the, the portion of the program that's down here is called a waterfall, and the waterfall uh, shows you the frequency content of this graph up here, but over time. And so looking at the waterfall and looking at the graph here, you can see that the signal has these two distinct peaks. And uh, those two uh, distinct peaks are uh, referred to as uh, frequency shift keying. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to encode information in a radio signal. And one way is to switch between two frequencies, that if this frequency is a zero, this frequency is a one, and then you jump back and forth, you go zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you encode the information. And so I went into this knowing that I will need to do some type of a frequency demodulation to be able to extract the signal out of um, the to be able to extract the digital information out of the signal that you see whenever I hit the button. So what you see here is a GNU Radio Companion. A GNU Radio Companion is a flow graph style data analysis tool that works fantastically for radio analysis stuff, hence why it's called radio, but you can actually do data analysis on this because this will take an input of a file and also output to a file. But anyway, 
Um, this tool was built on uh, Linux, and it, I believe most of the tool is built in Python. I guess there are some C portions of it that are optimized for you know, to, to make the data flow a little nicer. But um, if you want to get full use out of this tool, I would suggest running it on Linux. Uh, if you're like me and you just want to play around with it and you want to use it on Windows, um, it's kind of a pain in the butt to install. Um, it took a while, but there is a team that uh, makes uh, installers for uh, this tool. And um, you may have to search around on Google for, you know, the new radio companion installer or whatnot. So you will find it eventually. It's not super simple. Um, once you get it installed and you run it, it looks like this. Uh, in reality, uh, the companion part of GNU Radio Companion refers to this graphical user interface. And in reality, if you look at your taskbar when the thing is running, there is this command prompt running in the background, and this is actually GNU Radio. That GNU Radio is basically like a giant processing core. And this is just a nice uh, GUI to simplify using it. Now, this is not meant to be like a complete in-depth introduction course to GNU Radio. I just want to do some highlights and then uh, show you what I made and then um, basically walk you through some of the issues that I had and uh, the solutions for it because some of the stuff was not terribly obvious, unfortunately. So. Um, this is again GNU Radio. Um, up here you have the options block, and note that we are using uh, uh, generate options QT GUI. Uh, what this means is GNU Radio has uh, two different options for how to display things. Uh, one is QT, I think the other one is WX. And um, I guess WX is deprecated. They're not using it anymore. And so <clears throat> QT is the newer one. And then you have this a variable called sample rate. Um, GNU Radio uh, uses variables to drop stuff into other stuff, etc. Again, not meant to be super in-depth on this part. Um, it said variables can be used in blocks. So over here me move the video out of the way. Over here you have a whole giant list of blocks where you can go through and see all the different blocks. You can take a block. Um, let's say GUI widgets. Yep, the other style is WX, so we can grab a QT. Um, one of the things I found uh, very confusing almost right away is I wanted to... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I wanted to uh, show, um, to look at a graph of the data, like a scope. And um, let's say, I believe this is under instrumentation, QT, like that. And I'm sorry, if I look at WX, at WX is what I started with. Um, there's something called a scope sync, and the scope sync lets you hold data in one end and then look at a picture of the data. And uh, when I found out that WX uh, was deprecated, I was like, well, well, I'll use QT. And you go, oh, QT doesn't have a scope sync, so what do I do? And so in here, it's called the time sync. So you can grab the block and drag it over here and drop it. And there you go. You have your block on the screen. And um, the way the new radio companion works is that uh, on the side over here you start with sources, on the side over here you end in sinks, and the data has to start over here, pass all the way through over here, and then on the other side. And you will always start with a source of some sorts, and then you will always end with a sink, and then your data you know, migrates its way all the way through. <clears throat> 
Now, a couple other things to note is that, um, let me get a source of some sort. So you can search this by clicking this and go, uh, clicking this magnifying glass, which appears, uh, gives you a search box over here. And now you can look at a source. For, uh, and then there's a bunch of different sources, audio sources, waveform generators, um, we're just going to grab it, there we go, Osmocom source. So this Osmocom source is the source that interfaces with a um, uh, SDR. Um, there is also this RTL SDR source. I have not had much luck with, as much luck with this one, but I think that's more so because um, I'm not configuring it correctly. So I found the configuration for this particular source, and you can um, put in your device argument, which is RTL-SDR. Um, which is an important argument, and then import, other important arguments are your channel frequency and your channel RF gain. Um, I believe that's about everything you need to set up, and you obviously want to leave the channel gain mode in manual, and I think pretty much everything else stays the same. And I'm not going to go through in detail on how to set this up. I think that's about what you need to be able to do that. And what I'm going to show you is the project that I made to read my remote. Ta-da! All right, now let's walk through the projects. Over here on the left, we have the Osmocom, yeah, Osmocom source that talks to the RTL-SDR. We have signal processing in between, and then over here we have the QT GUI time sync and the custom data recorder. Um, let me pop this open so you can look at the settings uh, for my RTL SDR. Um, right, we talked about the device argument here. Um, the sample rate is a variable. You can see the variable right over here variable sample rate and uh, the uh, this block will pull data out of this variable and drop it in here um, something else to note is that uh, two things first of all uh, you see this underline for sample rate and a bunch of this other stuff and what that underline means is that uh, internally to the block there is a callback at least that's what they call it it's super confusing speak for if you were to update this variable while the uh, chain is running, uh, the system will automatically update your variable in this block. So, for instance, see how device arguments does not have an underline? That means that uh, this is set at runtime and you have to stop the chain uh, and restart it to be able to update that variable, whereas the sample, uh, uh, sample rate, SPS, um, has the underline. It means that um, you do not have to stop the tool chain uh, to update that variable. You can update it live. Um, something else to note is that everywhere where you see color, this color denotes the type of variable that can be input in these fields. Uh, that also holds true to uh, these right here. You see uh, the output of the Osmocon source is blue, and that means it, the output of the source is a complex number. Whereas the input of this complex to magnitude block is blue, and that means you can connect this to this, and everything is happy. And then the output of these complex to magnitude sources, orange, let's call that orange, uh, that output is a floating point number. So this block converts a complex number to a floating point number. 
now that we've gotten some of the pleasantries out of the way, uh, let's talk about my uh, signal processing chain. So from the uh, source, I am feeding the signal into two blocks in parallel. This complex to magnitude converter and this quadrature demod. What do they do? Complex to mag uh, effectively takes the complex number that comes out of here, which uh, I haven't actually looked at this number. You can represent a complex number as a magnitude and a phase or as uh, number plus uh, J or I, depending on your whether you're electrical or something else, another number. And so uh, effectively this complex to magnitude either um, finds the product of the two numbers, you know, you have your triangle, and I, I can't do the gesture as well, uh, you have your triangle and um, you have your uh, regular number on the x-axis and your complex number on the y-axis and then you find what the uh, magnitude that is or you have the magnitude and the phase and all you're doing is just stripping the phase off. The reason I'm using this and I found this in another YouTube video is that uh, this is a really good indication for when a real signal is coming through meaning that a signal that um, is not just garbage because if you were not aware, uh, the air around you is covered in, with lots of different radio waves, and those radio waves really screw with signals that you're trying to receive. And so uh, this complex to mag block allows you to detect the signal fairly easily, meaning that you look for when the complex to magnitude uh, vector, whatever, goes high, uh, signal is coming through and when it goes low the signal is gone and like it'll kind of ripple kind of go do these things but you'll never have this really nice clean jump so then the quadrature demod would be the other one and uh, what the quadrature demod does is it converts uh, the frequency changes of the frequency shift keying into a signal. It's effectively audio signal that comes out of this block, but um, for our purposes it converts it into highs and lows where um, the way it sort of looks like is you have uh, in the middle uh, you have your uh, baseband frequency and whenever the frequency goes high the signal will go high. Whenever the frequency goes low um, the signal will go low, and so what you'll get is this sort of square wavy type signal right around uh, zero. Uh, that's, you know, if audio was actually encoded in it, it would be audio, but in this case it's a square wave because you're sending zeros and ones. And uh, what we can do is we can, uh, let's grab this time sink and actually try and look at what that signal looks like and we'll walk through our signal chain looking at the signals one by one to see what they actually look like and what the different blocks do. So we're going to drop this block in here. We're going to connect it up to here and to here. Something to note is that this top one is in zero and this bottom one is in one. And the reason why that's important is, let me pop this block open. The reason why that's important is the trigger. Because for the trigger, um, we need to trigger off of something. And the trigger tends to be, well, you can set the trigger level, at, well, I'm sorry, trigger channel. And so the trigger channel here is zero. And since we grab the block from the beginning, observe from the end of the chain, and we're moving into the beginning of the chain, we need to reconfigure it a little bit. So um, let's leave it normal. Uh, let's switch this to about 0.5. And I'm putting these settings in basically from memory because I've been messing around with the signal. So you, if you're doing your own 
um, stuff, you may have to play around with the settings or even use the auto settings. So that's the trigger. We want to trigger on a positive slope, meaning the signal has to go from low to high. And this is where that complex to magnitude block comes in is because we can use it to trigger. So then let's go to general. Um, that should be enough points. I do need to remove this piece and I will talk about that later. So for the time being, I want this block to run at the raw sample rate, which is right here, which is 4.8 mega samples a second. I need to make the line then um, make it three, negative three. Let's make this positive three, like that. And I think we're good to go. And um, once everything is set up and you're ready to run, um, as you notice, it's red here. Whenever you hit this play button, that's when the code will begin to run. And it'll automatically save. And so we hit play. This goes black and save gets grayed out. It's automatically saved. And down here, you will notice that stuff is appearing like that. Oh, oops, let me close out of this. I meant to uh, disable that guy because we just want to look at this one for now. So play again. Um, down here, you'll see sort of a command prompt type output or council type output of the signal. <clears throat> and so now we are all ready. And I'm going to hit the button on the remote and we will see our signal. Boom. And the red is channel 2. And so the red is the... Um, so look for the red is the actual bits. And if you sort of carefully look at it and uh, with the um, time sort, let me try it again. Um, with this time source, uh, the, sorry, time sync, that, sorry, being, it's very tongue tied. You can drag a box over something to zoom into it. And you can see that every uh, whenever this signal is high, you can see the bits down here. But see how they're super, super choppy? We can zoom into that even further. And you can see the bits, right? That looks like a bit pattern. But oh boy, do they have a lot of hash in them. Uh, and uh, what you see here is just kind of a random trigger. That happens that there's a, as I mentioned, there's a lot of noise. Um, you can right click to zoom out once and then twice. Takes you back to the beginning here. That if you zoomed in twice, meaning that if you zoom in and zoom in again, you can go one, two, and that will zoom you out twice. If you zoomed in three times, you can click three times to back out. But all this red here is noise. This is just crap that is out in the air, and this is basically why it's so difficult to sometimes filter that stuff. But if you look carefully, um, let me try and there we go. If you look at carefully at the blue, the blue here is uh, the uh, because of the complex uh, to magnitude, right? The blue staying right around zero, it's a little off zero. And so whenever the blue jumps, <coughs> it makes it nice to detect. So let me zoom out again and push the button on the remote. And boom, you see some type of a signal. So now we need to clean up some of this noise over here. And the way we can clean up that noise is with a low pass filter because, let me zoom in here, what we can see is, like right here, um, is the signal, um, uh, I'm trying to think what's the word, the highest frequency of the signal is right here. So if we look at what this frequency is, I, if I remember correctly, this is around 20 kilohertz. So it's, it's right at audio, uh, right in the audio range. So we can make a low pass filter to cut this out. 
um, and you know limit it to like 30 maybe 40 kilohertz and get rid of all of this crap see all this noise and clean it up now GNU Radio Companion gives you a nice tool um, to be able to design filters and the filters we have here is called a fur filter an FIR filter FIR stands for a finite input response a finite input response filter um, takes a bunch of blocks and then delays the signal every so often you know not every delays that signal so many blocks and then it multiplies those blocks by an exponent and then adds those blocks up and then that becomes the next point in the signal chain again maybe i'll do a video on fur filters later but that's about the synopsis that you need that a, uh, a fur filter uh, has basically two parameters that you need to worry about it's how many blo delay blocks you have and then what the exponents of those blocks are and so uh, GNU Radio Companion has a nice tool if we go tool filter design tool takes a second to launch that lets you design an FIR filter and very simply you choose that it's a fur filter we're already doing a low pass uh, we need to put in the sampling rate which is four million eight hundred thousand like that um, and you need to choose two frequencies the beginning of the pass band and i'm sorry the end of the pass band and the beginning of the stop band and the filter will design it for you so here is 50,000 so let's let's leave it at 50,000 and let's make this like 70,000 oh come on 70,000 like that and we want the attenuation to be 40 dB if you don't understand anything that I'm saying don't be discouraged uh, filters uh, is something that will take time to learn and i will also do videos on filters eventually but for right now that all you need to know is and here let me hit design and what this graph here will show you is uh, we start at effectively zero frequency and then come up here to um, about fifty thousand hertz and there's no attenuation here meaning the whole signal gets through but then you get this much it's you know you get 40 db of attenuation after that so what do you do with this it took me a hot second to figure this out the <clears throat> it was not super duper um, straightforward so uh, what you see down here is the number of taps and that is how many different delay blocks you have and if we come up here and go to filter coefficients, here are all of the different coefficients. Ta -da. And what you do is you can copy all of these. And you want to omit the taps equals. You just want to grab it here like that. And hold on. This thing is finicky. Go like that. You can hit control C to do a copy and you can close out of this and you can grab one of these interpolating FIR filters I just happen to grab the interpolating kind there is another kind of decimating I think interpolating FIR filter and a decimating FIR filter are your two choices I honestly don't know what the difference is so eh, I use this and it worked you go ahead double click on it to open it up and then you copy that information into this taps section here like that and you may have to set what kind of number this thing takes in and gives out and here we have uh, float to float with real taps and I copy that information in here and you can see there's a ton of taps that are being used here and so now what we can do is we can see what the signal looks like and I use the same exactly the same filter for them both we can see what the signal looks like instead of looking at it here we can see what it looks like here 
And so we can take and click on each one of these arrows and delete them. Like that, slide this over, and let's connect this up and have a squiz and what the signal looks like. And now we can hit play. Wait for it to launch. Do, 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 do. And now when I hit play, we see that a lot of the chop that was in that signal is gone. See how nice that is? What we did is we got rid of all of the uh, high frequency noise in the signal with a low pass filter. So if we zoom in on the section here, see, doesn't that look like bits now? See, this was exciting to get to right here that the signal looks actually very clean. So right click to zoom out. And if we look over here, here's all of our noise. And all of this noise, as I said, is difficult to figure out what it's doing, what it is. And so it's nice to have, see, so you get this nice blue line that comes up here, comes across and drops down, that this is, while the signal is active, this is what it looks like. Okay, so now we have the signal cleaned up. And after the fur filters, we have these rational resamplers. Uh, in reality, I probably don't need these. I say in reality because uh, originally I put them in because I was having issues with the WX blocks. And as you just saw, this QT block can... Um, use the full 4.8 mega samples whereas the WX blocks was really struggling oh well um, they just kind of ended up having to be included in my tool chain here and um, what these uh, rational resampler blocks do is they uh, take a certain uh, bit rate in and then output a fraction of that bit rate with interpolation being the numerator and decimation being the denominator. If we pop this guy open and look at the documentation, it doesn't have any. It said online I found just that statement that I told you that um, it, it takes in a bit rate and then gives out a bit rate which is a fraction of um, the, the input bit rate. And so in this case, I'm taking uh, 4.8 million samples a second and multiplying it by half, which is basically just the divide by two. And so the output now is 2.4 million samples a second. And uh, the reason why I got rid of that two, if I pop this, um, not two, I guess, the reason why I pop, uh, got rid of this divide by Uh, where is it? Uh, like that before is because if I hit OK now, the sample rate here is 2.4 million samples a second as it is here, whereas before we were using 4.8 million samples a second. And so now if we undo, uh, remove these arrows, slide this down more, and connect these guys and run it again you will see the whole thing at the slower um, 2.4 million samples a second and so if I hit play again uh, now you see that we have signal noise signal some noise and signal and what I learned is that my remote actually sends three uh, bursts for every button click and something else I learned is that uh, at the beginning of the signal, this section here is like a wake-up call. This wake-up call is meant to wake up the um, receiver of the car, which is asleep, by sending just a whole bunch of bits just over and over and over again. And the actual transmission begins here. Not only is it... Make that a little better. There we go. So wake up signal, wake up signal, wake up signal. And then right here is uh, what you would call the preamble. The preamble um, is the same on every signal, uh, on every single signal so that the receiver can 
uh, use these bits to synchronize to the signal and then receive the signal in knowing that this is the correct signal. And like I said, as you can see, one, two, three per every button click. So our next block in our chain is the threshold block. And the threshold block is meant to um, clean the signal up even more than our fur filters did before. And if we go ahead and remove these guys and attach it here, we can see what it does and talk about it. So the threshold block here, uh, if the signal is below uh, 200, M is 0.2. And we saw that the signal goes up to about 1.5. So if the signal drops below 0.2, the output of this block is 0. If the block goes above 0.4, the output is 1. And the reason why these two numbers are opposite of each other, uh, maybe opposite's not the right word, um, the reason why there's a gap between these two numbers is to give this a little bit of hysteresis and so that if the signal is just a little choppy, the hysteresis can help cut it out. Uh, same thing here. If the signal goes below 0.2, you output a 0. If the signal goes above 0.2, you output a 1. And so now if we hit play, we can see that the signals will now be shifted up and you will have a very clean... Uh, square wave. Let me hit the button on the remote. Boom. Very clean square wave. So not a lot of choppiness. Let me zoom in right here and see. Nice and crisp edges, etc. This really, really, really cleans it up nicely. Really cleans it up nicely. And they all look to be about the same size. There's no weird things happening. And those are the thresholding blocks. They help us do that. The final thing that we do, and let me get rid of this all together, is we multiply the two signals together and then uh, feed that into here. And let me enable this block. And what that further does is the multiplication uh, helps to eliminate the noise in between the signals. And so now if I hit play, this one will come up. And I push the button on the remote, and boom. The scaling is a little different, but the uh, time span is exactly the same. And you can see that it helps to kill the signal that is in between whenever nothing is coming through. And it helps with the analysis because now I don't have to worry about the crap and noise and stuff that's in between here. Um, something else that I wanted to note, and I forgot to note this earlier, is uh, the way you choose how wide of a signal that you're looking at is by setting the number of points the thing displays you. And you can um, do the math, or you can just play it by ear um, to figure it out. So display it, choose more symbols, less symbols, etc. So everything up to this point has been just, um, uh, what's the word, signal prepping, not really even signal, you know, manipulating a signal to make it look nice for the purposes of analysis. And where we really start to get into it is with this guy, which uh, this is a custom Python block, if we... Python. So there's a Python module and a Python block. What I'm using is the Python block here. <clears throat> if I pop open the block here, um, you can see that uh, it has preamble bits, and this is one of those uh, live updatable uh, variables, and uh, edge offset, which is another live updatable variable. And uh, the way you pop this guy open is if you go open an editor, and it will ask you to choose an editor. Um, I happen to use Notepad++, which is not the best Python editor, but it works. Uh, do, 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 Notepad++, like that. And Notepad++ will open with the code that I've put in here. And... 
the disclaimer here is I'm not a Python coder. This is my first time coding Python. And so um, this may not be the most uh, elegant code, just fair warning. So I will post this code up on my website in case anybody wants to use it. But what I wanted to do is walk through some things that I experienced writing this code, which I don't know, was a learning experience for me. And so let's start with a few things. First of all, uh, no, I don't know, the one updated right now. So the first thing is we can cancel out of this block. Uh, this block has inputs and outputs. And right now I have two inputs that are floating point. But if I come over here and um, let's see here, right here, the in signal is um, two floating points and I have no out signal at the moment. And uh, the way this works is that whenever you save the code, the block here gets live updated. The catch is that if you, let's say, make a, um, a syntax error, instead this will show up as red, and instead of a play button, you'll have this guy, which this guy will sort of tell you where the mistake is. Not always but sort of. So let me see if I can induce a mistake for you. Let's throw another comma right here and then save it. And now when I come back to here, nope, I guess that's not enough to induce a mistake. You know, like this and then save it. It really doesn't like indent errors. Still nothing. Hmm. Oh, because we're not in an indenty section over here. That should be a nice indenty section. There we go. Here's our custom data recorder, uh, oops, our custom data decoder, and now it's red, and the play button's grayed out, and this guy will tell me that something, 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 uh, unindent error, uh, line 77. And if we go back to our code, it said, see, the, the indent error doesn't like, because it's saying 77, but we're actually someplace else, etc. But anyway, indent errors uh, with Python, and uh, everything is indent-based. And so you, it takes four spaces to create an indent. So since I deleted one, there were three spaces, and that's what it was angry about. So... Um, that's the first thing to note. The next thing to note is that um, you can get uh, runtime errors. And let me see if I can demonstrate a runtime. Oh, I need to save it. Now that I saved it, see we're back to live again. Now I can induce a, I should be able to induce a runtime error, which I think if I put a comma here, save it, and then run it. Maybe I'll get a runtime error. Let's see what happens. Nope, no runtime error. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think how I can induce a runtime error for you. Uh, they're they're so easy to. Oh, I know. Um, let's see here. Stuff equals other st other stuff divided by seven. I'm pretty sure that should do a runtime error for me. Okay, so we're not red, and we'll hit play, and it should crash. And there we go. I don't know why it does the zeros thing right here. 
But what you can see is I induced a runtime error, and this runtime error. Oh, come on. Scroll too far, sorry. Uh, error global name other stuff is not defined. So basically, I used a variable that doesn't exist, and that's why it's upset. Part of the problem with this is sometimes it doesn't always give you exactly where. So is it line 50? Is it line 255? Is it line 55? Uh, this gets messy. If we come over here and look, it is line 50 is where the error was caused. And so if you get a runtime error, you're looking at this last line because you're, you know, as we saw, we induced the, the, the faults in 955. So this is... This took me some getting used to this type of coding style that uh, because this is Python is interpreted code, it is not compiled code. Um, runtime type errors happen at runtime because the code, you know, the compiler can't, since there's no compiler, the compiler can't check. And so let's go ahead and wipe this line out. <coughs> and get into the meat and potatoes of the code. All right, so whenever you um, set up a new Python block, and let's maybe I should go ahead and do that, grab a Python block so we can look inside. As you can see, the standard Python block takes complex, complex in, and outputs complex. And again, we double click on it and go open an editor. Go ahead and choose an editor. Notepad plus plus. And so here is our standard um, Python block. Uh, the NumPy library is already imported. Uh, the uh, GNU Radio library is already imported. And we have work, which work uh, is the function that gets executed to run your code. And then you have this init function. This init function is what sets you up for the stuff that you want to do. So, for example, we talked about the in signal and the out signal. Uh, if we want to have another out signal, let's say mp dot uh, load thirty two, and then we save this. If we come over here and look. Now we have a complex output and we have a floating output. And over here, so I can pop open my thing and so we want it the other way. We want to mp dot uh, float 32 comma here. And then we save it. We'll have two inputs and two outputs. So we go save. And then we take over here and see we have two inputs and two outputs in the order that we take them in. Um, also, um, as you can see, we have an example parameter, one. And if we look in here, we the example parameter is right here. These are parameters that are taken in from the function. And if you define it down here as self example param equals example param, um, you get that underscore I'm sorry, underline under the number to get that callback feature so that if you have a variable that you need to um, examine uh, live, you can do that. Sorry about that. So, <clears throat> uh, something to be careful with these here. Um, I was having lots of problems putting in parameters for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. I kept getting runtime errors and said I, I use these very sparingly. I only have two because said I, I was having all kinds of problems and it took me quite a while to figure out that that particular workflow of you make a little change over here, particularly in this section, making changes is very problematic. At least for me it was. And again, I'm not a GNU radio expert. I'm not a Python expert. I just, I really stumbled my way through this. But unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of documentation available. I had to get like a little 
little bits and pieces here or there. But anyway, so that is how you create a block. Um, that is how you enter things into it. And we can go ahead and close out of view and save view. And we can delete this block. I'm just hitting the delete key. Delete. So back to the code. Uh, <clears throat> something else that uh, I want to mention right away is debugging. Um, debugging I found very difficult in GNU Radio. I really struggled with debugging for quite some time, and here is my strategy for debugging. Let me find the section right here. So this section right here, let me uncomment it, like that, is how I debug. Uh, Python lets you write data to a file. Uh, the first catch is that uh, when writing data to a file uh, in Windows, I don't know about um, in Linux, in Windows, you need to make a d uh, directory, in this case it's C logs. And I, I took the permissions for that directory and I set them to everyone with both read and write permission. And that's the only way I was able to do this because launching uh, GNU Radio Companion as an, an administrator is also problematic. And so I said the workaround of making the directory available to everyone to took some finding. So it was kind of annoying. Um, the next thing is uh, the majority of the operators that are used come out of the NumPy library. And so um, what I found is that I can take the uh, as type uh, operator in NumPy library and convert stuff. And so uh, my data set is uh, all in floating point, and uh, it probably doesn't have to be, but that's just the way I did it. And so I take my data and using as type, I convert it to int in my intermediate variable. And then I take my intermediate variable and convert it to string. And there's a function called join and join basically uh, converts uh, this um, array, which in this case it becomes an array of strings, uh, into one large string. And in here I included a comma and carriage return as my delimiters. And so this effectively turns it into a CSV, a comma separated variable file. And this lets me pull the data into um, uh, Excel and graph, you know, and graph it to be able to look at it because I was having all kinds of problems even figuring out what's going on just by looking at the data. So this is the way, this is one way to debug. Um, something I didn't note is if I try to uh, shorthand this and write all of this just directly in the write file, I would get just a little bit of the beginning, a little bit at the end, and that's it. It was kind of annoying. So what I found that works is that if I load all the data just kind of in chunky steps, and then once I finally have a string, I can dump the string to text file, and then I would do uh, space, actually wrote out the word space because it's easy to find in Excel. I can just do control F and find space to be able to uh, chunk my data apart. <clears throat> and then obviously you want to close the file. So that's one way to debug. The other way to debug is with uh, messages. Um, so whenever stuff happens, you can do print. And then you can print um, with text in, quote, in single quotes, comma, and then some sort of a number, and then you can do comma another number. This is really helpful for printing, excuse me, printing stuff out. This is another way to debug. And uh, this stuff comes out basically in the command prompt or down if we take a look at comes out down here so we can actually scroll up and we can see some of the output there we go so 
like that. And let me comment this back out. Uh, like so. And let's now take a deep dive into the code. So I apologize now. This section might get a little rambly. But let's see what we get through. Um, the first thing that I noted while working on this was that uh, the data comes in in pieces. It does not come in as a whole or in big chunks. Sometimes you'll get a couple of thousand points. Sometimes you'll get two. I never quite found a pattern for uh, the order or how the points are coming in. And so what I did was is I set up some global variables. They're right up here. Uh, these global variables uh, will hold the data as long as the project is running, when, once you hold the play. And these uh, variables let me bring pieces of the data in and kind of stack them up on top <clears throat> um, so that I can analyze the data as a whole. Um, a drawback that I found to that and it, it took me, and again, I'm not a Python coder. This, this is a learning experience in Python for me. What I found is that while in C, which is I'm most comfortable with, a global variable is a global variable. In Python, you actually have to go in and tell Python that, oh, by the way, your variable's global. You should look for it globally. I don't know. I found this weird. But anyway, uh, the data comes in into input items as a list of lists, so to speak. And I'm taking uh, input item zero, which is a list of stuff, and I'm converting it to a, a NumPy array and storing it. And then item uh, one, which is the second input item, this is the actual data, I'm storing it in one. So. The way this works is, first I check, is any item in, in 0 greater than 0, 5? Remember, we chunked it up so it's uh, all, the ver all the levels are between 0 and a 1. And so if there's anything in here greater than a 1, that means something happened. Uh, a message is coming through, or there's an edge, or something like that. And then I'm using a state machine, and the state machine has three states. I'm looking for a leading edge um, in the uh, in the zero. Um, then state two is I'm looking for a trailing edge I, uh, for um, the death or in zero. And while I'm looking for a trailing edge, I'm collecting all of the data that's coming through. And then uh, once a trailing edge is found, state three is where I actually do the data analysis. And so Let's see here. So if any part of M0 is greater than 5, um, go ahead and start with state 1. If we come up here and we see that I initialize a state to state 1. And so in state 1, I check to see if there's a leading edge. And I do this by subtracting the back hat of basically like if you imagine uh, an array of four members. I take that array and I subtract out the array but offset by one. And what I'm doing is I'm checking to see what the difference is between numbers. And I'm checking to see if that difference is negative because if I have a leading edge, I go from a low to a from a low to a high. And if I will go from a low to a high, and then I subtract uh, the high from the low, I'll get a negative number, which would be my leading edge. So then I check to see, is the length of the array checking for the leading edge greater than 1? Because just in case if I have two leading edges in 1, and if I do, I'll print something. This is just kind of a note to myself. I haven't seen this come up yet. So the way the data chunks out is I only have enough data to catch one leading edge and then enough data to catch one trailing edge. I, don't, I haven't seen a leading and a trailing edge in one yet. But anyway, if there's any leading edge, 
I grab the location of that leading edge and I store it in start. And I do have this plus zero here, which I haven't played with, but I might just to see uh, how well the data comes in because you have to do some analysis to the data to be able to find the beginning uh, edge correctly. And so it might help to throw some data out. And then uh, we change the state to two because we found the leading edge and we go ahead and start appending uh, to data to data set in one which is the actual signal we only care about finding the leading edge of uh, in zero but in one is our actual waveform for the data so then in state two every time we're in state two we need to keep appending the data and looking for the trailing edge so we find the trailing edge in exactly the same way but the trailing edge is going to be positive because you're going to go from a, a, a high a one down to a zero so a one minus a zero gives you a one and so that would be a positive and if we find that we check to make sure that there's no multiple edges uh, we grab the uh, location of where that is and here's the um, catch is that the location is in the middle of the packet somewhere that came in but then there's this entire data set that we've accumulated and so actually i guess it's more like this the pack the location of the stop is somewhere in the between here but it's at the end of this giant data set that we've collected and so we have to subtract off the length of the current in and add the location to be able to give us the position of where it is inside the last packet. And then once we find the trailing edge, we go to state three. State three is the data analysis. And so in the data analysis, we take our data set and we trim the beginning of it with start. Now, as far as uh, the number of bits, and the lengths of the packets, most of the stuff I had to figure out just by trial and error and by um, analyzing the data, by debugging, as I showed you, I would dump it into Excel, and then I would look at how stuff lined up. And so I found that uh, the FOB sends 118 bits of data. But 118 bits is not a nice uh, binary number. 112 is a nice binary number, which is 14 bytes. And so eventually what I do uh, down uh, below um, is I, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I subtract off six bits of the preamble, which are all the same and they never change. And so if I lose the beginning six bits of the preamble, it's really irrelevant because the data is everything after the preamble and what we'll see here shortly is that the first uh, several bytes never change of the message and i'm eventually curious to check the second uh, key fob that we have to see if the everything after the preamble stays the same it is the same as, on both key fobs something i will check eventually but anyway the next bit here is we check to see if our data set is greater than 10,000. And anything below 10,000 is just garbage that was caught accidentally. And again, this is uh, this was found empirically. I measured it to see how much data came through, et cetera, to be able to figure that out. So the next thing is that if our data set is less than 35,000, uh, set the packet length bits to 54. What I found was if you hold the button on the remote, the remote will actually start sending different data after six packets of regular data, and the new de the different data is shorter. And so the shorter data, again, I found empirically by capturing the data and measuring it that it used sending 54 bits. And hey, it turns out that if you subtract off six, you're down to 48, which is a nice binary number of six bytes. And so that also works out nicely. 
So the next section here is um, I check to see if the data is over 70,000 points. And I mentioned this previously. What I found is the very first packet of data always has this padding of a bunch of, it, it almost looks like a preamble, but there's, I think, like 70 of them. And uh, what it's doing is just waking up the receiver that's in the car. And so if I hit that section, I need to discard all of that until I get to the um, actual data. And the way I do this is, first of all, uh, I take the edges. Uh, well, I find the edges. And I find the edges the same way that um, I did before, is I take the array and I subtract it from itself, but offset by one. And I look for all of the edge locations and store where they're located at. Um, then I find the edge differences, meaning that I find this, I find the spacing between the edges by subtracting the uh, trailing edge from the leading edge to find our edge differences. And then basically I throw away the first 20 edges. Because, again, in, uh, empirically, I found that if I throw away the first 20 edges, I should be well within that section where the edges uh, are all the same, where it's just like 70 edges and they're all spaced exactly the same. And um, once I'm well into that section, I can now basically look for any edge that is greater than that which is going to be the beginning of the packet because there's this big kind of uh, section. And actually, why don't we take a quick peek at that? Uh, let me fire this up. Hopefully, I didn't break anything while dicking around with the code. And now we're running and hit the button. And there we go. And right here, you see you have... Um, a whole bunch of bits. This is the wake-up signal. Then you have this big old gap, and then you have the message. And uh, all the other two messages, you have this big old weird gap, and then message, big old weird gap, and message. And that's what I'm doing. I'm starting into here by throwing away the first 20 edges, and then I look for the edge difference that's larger to get me to here. And the rest of my data analysis depends on me starting somewhere over here. <clears throat> so let's jump back in the code, and that's where we start here. Um, right here starts the assumption of that we're at the beginning of the of those weird edges, and there's a preamble uh, coming. And so same thing, we find all the edges. We find the locations of those edges. We find the differences, uh, meaning that the distances between all of the edges. And then we grab one of the edges into the, the difference of one of the edges into the packet. And we go, well, in the preamble, we're probably, uh, all of the edges are very similarly spaced together. So if we grab one of the edge differences in the preamble, we can now use that to compare and throw stuff away at the beginning of the packet. And so this average here grabs something from the beginning of the packet, and I wrapped it in a try except uh, because sometimes garbage comes in and it gets past all of the other filters and things like that, and so I was crashing occasionally in the section. So I put a nice little wrap around and Although average is supposed to be an average, I found that it's reasonably nice to just grab, um, <clears throat> reasonably nice just to grab one of the edge differences and throw it in here. And once that check comes back as okay, um, I can go ahead and figure out where uh, the preamble edges start. So the idea is that at the beginning of at the beginning of the packet, you have garbage, and then you have a whole bunch of evenly spaced preamble bits. 
And so what I do is so I grab the preamble, one uh, difference of edges of the preamble, and then I go through and I throw away everything that's 10% bigger or 10% small. Once I do that, uh, just in case I had something that slipped through the cracks, something that's within that 10%, but still at the very beginning, I go ahead and I check to see if all of those edges are consecutive. Because if I found the beginning of the uh, preamble, all of the following edges are going to be within that plus minus 10%, and they're all going to be consecutive. <clears throat> and so down here, I check for the consecutiveness of them. And what I also found, sometimes you have an edge that slips through that, you know, in the garbage, before all of the nice clean edges, sometimes you'll have an edge that's the same as the preamble ones. And so what I try here is to throw uh, edges away from, you know, to carve them off at the beginning. And I try three times because I've never really seen more than one kind of slip through. And anything more than three means that the packet that I got was garbage to begin with and we'll just throw it away. Once everything is thrown away and we're to the good packet, we go ahead and we uh, figure out what the period of our signal is. And so this theoretically can adapt to <clears throat> variation in the crystal, etc. And so what I do is I average a bunch of once I know that they're all preamble bits, I average a bunch of the preamble bits together, and then I multiply it by two, which gives me the period. It gives me the width of one bit start to finish. Um, and then I change my start to, uh, and this is important, of an index of one oak. The reason this index is important, and we'll take a look at this in just a second, actually won't we pull it up now, fire it up. Um, what I found is that un, uh, unlike, let's say, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, on-off shift key, I think. So if we look at the data here, uh, if we carefully look at the data, you see that you have short bits and you have long bits. And it took me a minute to uh, figure this out, but uh, the way this data is actually coded is called Manchester coding. Manchester coding uh, codes the data instead of highs and lows, it codes it into rising edges or falling edges. And so every time you have a rising edge in the middle of a bit, it is <clears throat> a zero or a one, just depends on the coding scheme. And every time you have a falling edge in the middle of a bit, you have a falling, uh, a, a, a zero or one. And they're mutually exclusive. So if a rising edge is a zero, then a falling edge is a one. If a falling edge is a zero, then a rising edge is a one. And what I found is that, let me zoom out, if we look at this section here, and it took me, again, a hot second to find uh, figure this out, that if I find this edge right here, I am misaligned by half a bit all the way through the message. And so the reason why that's indexed off by one is that I'm actually grabbing this edge right here. And once I grab this edge, I am aligned with the rest of the message near perfectly. Back to the code. So now I create two arrays, and those arrays uh, give me the points that line up with just before uh, the edge and just after the edge. And the reason I did that was to basically double check myself um, because if you're looking for a rising edge and you take a sample just before it should be low and the sample just after it should be high and if you x or um, those together uh, then you should get a true and so if i take all the samples just before and all the samples just after and i 
explore all of them together, I should only get trues back. And that verifies that the integrity of my packet was good. And so what I do is I create a table that has the locations of all of the ticks uh, for the leading at just before the edge and then all of the ticks for just after the edge. <clears throat> And the way I create this is with a, a, a range with the start being just before and then a bunch of offsets using the period and that 118 bits or the 54 bits. And same thing, but with the, uh, uh, the edge going the opposite direction. <clears throat> Um, I have a little catch here to make sure that um, I don't index out of the array. It happens sometimes. And then I do uh, a reshape. And what the reshape does is, well, first of all, I convert the data to trues and falses, and then I do a reshape, and the reshape takes my big array and condenses it down to just the points of interest and once I have those points of interest, I do another reshape and turn it into, well, first of all, I discard six right here. And then I do a reshape so that uh, instead of having one long um, array, now I have eight bits, uh, uh, a bunch of eight bit two dimensional array type things. And finally, I convert it and display it. And this is how my code works. So, um, oh, if I convert it, I display it. I have a bunch of stuff to show you errors. Uh, and down here, once we get out of state three, we want to go back to state one. And then we want to go ahead and um, reset a bunch of our variables, which there are some extras here that we don't necessarily need. And finally, we end the whole thing with return len of input items. And this is surprisingly important because it will cause runtime errors if you don't have this in there. And you start off with this. Uh, something else to note is that uh, if you want to output stuff, you can output stuff to the output items. But, and I haven't figured out yet how to do this, but... Uh, other than this, but uh, the length of the output items needs to match the length of the input items, or otherwise you get runtime errors and stuff crash. But anyway, um, let's go ahead and run this, and we can watch it operate. So when we hit the button, we can see we get our three messages. And I'm going to minimize, actually, not minimize, I'm going to just jump over here. And if I expand this, you can see the, the data, the three packets, this one, this one, and this one, that are transmitted. And so uh, if you look at our preamble, FD, AE, 35, uh, D5, 2B, uh, I believe at 2B, those are the last things. And as you can see, I was not pushing the button, and we had an average failed. And that's because the antenna picked up some garbage that was just enough stuff to be able to do it, but we didn't crash. And that's where that uh, try section is very important, is that you got to look for those errors, because if you crash, you have to stop and then hit play again. It's a crashed on a wrong time uh, runtime error and again I'm not touching the remote both hands are off the remote but you can see that uh, data set was too short and again we just picked up some garbage um, that was coming through and so now if I actually hit the button we'll get five messages again and if you look right here Right at this line, the end of the message differs, but the beginning of the message is the same. The D5 to B, FX, DB, 83, uh, DB is the same, but you can see 85, 29, none of these match. And so now we can hold the button and show you the shorter message as well. 
So let's do one button press and you'll see a bunch of messages come through, but now I'm going to hold the button and you'll see the message length get shorter. And there's the shorter message. And as long as I keep holding the button and we crashed on something. See, I was line 197. I'll have to see what's going on there, but again, it's a issue of you have to try and throw away the, the garbage and keep the good stuff, and sometimes you can't always figure out where the garbage ends and the good stuff begins, and that's where you get crashes like this because you index out of arrays and other gross, icky things. And so this is how my code works. Um, so something to note is that on my remote, as long as I'm holding the button and we're to the short message, you can see the short message stays the same. The same, the same, the same. And then uh, before the short message is transmitted, you get six of the regular messages. <clears throat> In this case, this one failed because the preamble was not consecutive. It must have just missed being uh, non-consecutive, which is odd. Uh, six, okay, so like this one, for example, I'm, I'm printing the, the, um, uh, yeah, I'm printing the order of the uh, bits, and so five, six, seven, eight, nine are missing from here, and that's why it's, that one wasn't consecutive. And so forth. And so there you go. Hopefully this has been informative and you didn't mind the video and audio quality issues. I said I had the time and opportunity to make the video and so I, I didn't have all of my recording equipment with me, but I did want to show you some new stuff I have been working on. And so um, now I'm hoping that you got a nice look into uh, GNU Radio. So I, uh, please let me know in the comments down below if uh, you are interested in any other GNU Radio um, um, videos. So there are some other remotes that I wanted to read, including my garage door opener. So that's um, something I might work on in the future. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, you're welcome to put them down below. So um, please don't forget to uh, hit the thumbs up. The thumbs up uh, is always nice. And um, thank you for watching.